to pick up Ace-9 suited in the cutoff, the hijack raises to 30. He's a solid regular. I call. The big blind calls. We're going three ways to the flop in position. It comes 9-8-6 rainbow. We've got top pair and a backdoor flush draw. The opponents check. I doubt the hijack has better than top pair, otherwise he would have bet. We probably have the best hand and need to protect our equity. We don't want to see any Broadway cards other than an ace. There are a number of other bad cards for us as well. I bet 50. I'm most concerned about the big blind having strong hands since this is a board that she could have connected well with. She'll have straights that neither the hijack or I will have. And she can have all the set and suited two pair combos. Thankfully she folds. The hijack is more reluctant. He calls. The turn is the ace of hearts giving us top two pair. The hijack checks. My read is that he may have check-called our flop bet with two overs, so I'm hoping he has a hand like Ace-King that we can extract a lot of value from. I bet 130. There's a good amount of hesitation from the opponent. Eventually, he makes the call, though. The river is the queen of spades. It's not my favorite. I would have preferred a three or a deuce. It's especially worrisome because Jack-10 gets there to make the straight. The opponent checks. One thing that used to hurt my win rate a lot was being afraid to value bet rivers when I had strong but non-nutted hands. I used to check back too frequently in these scenarios. Here I bet 320 for value. I can maybe get called by ace-king, ace-jack, or a few other holdings if the hijack just doesn't believe that we're strong. He appears to genuinely be torn about whether to call or fold. About 45 seconds later, the hijack ultimately folds what he'd say is queen-10. He flopped two overs and a double gutter, then rivered second pair but thought that I could be bluffing. I let him know that he made the right laydown. Had you the whole way. This ends up being our last hand in 510. Over a half hour later, we get four dues suited in the straddle. The big blind is a high stakes reg who's similar to Greg Maddox in that he doesn't give many walks. The big blind raises to 160. We saw a few deuces come out on the board just recently. Therefore, we know it's within the realm of possibility to make a big hand holding a deuce. Plus we're in position, which is the best. We call for 120 more. It's just the two of us. We can make it if we try. The flop comes 10-5 deuce with two clubs and a heart. We've got bottom pair and some backdoor drops. The big blind checks. We've got showdown value and have plenty of cards that can help us improve. We check back future trips as the turn is another deuce. We have a sneaky three of a kind and an opponent who's very generous. He donates 120 to the charity for lanky white guys. While all donations are appreciated, I know that the big blind can afford to give more. I see if he'd like to give 360 to us. The opponent has a big heart, an even bigger wallet. Without much hesitation, he calls a 360. This is a great scenario for us. The river is the seven of spades. The flush draw and all straight draws miss. The big blind checks. It's difficult to make trips. And after we check back the flop, the odds of us having a monster hand are drastically reduced. So our line looks like we either have three of a kind or nothing. We're gonna bury bonds this one and swing for the fences with a $1,200 bet. A call here would be fantastic. It doesn't look like the opponent has much though. He folds. Perhaps he had some sort of draw that bricked. We win it, but really need to take down a bigger pot to keep a healthy profit since it's $90 a round between the straddle, blinds, and the $20 big blind ante that we're playing with. We pick up the perfect hand to win a large pot with. The deck has bestowed two kings upon us in the big blind to help us destroy our frenemies at the poker table. The cutoff limps in. He's the same player who we beat with eight deuce offsuit in the first hand of our high stakes portion of the session. The player on our right in the small blind has no sympathy for people who limp around. He raises to 240. The small blind has been raising to isolate and punish the limper fairly often. It's not conduct that's appropriate when royalty is present. We put in the three bet to 700 to show him what's up. I expect the cutoff to fold quickly. He has other ideas. He limp calls the three bet for 660 more. I didn't see that coming at all. The cutoff only has about 3600 more in his stack. The small blind isn't sure what's going on, but he doesn't like it. He folds. It's down to heads up and we're out of position. The flop comes queen nine five with two diamonds. We have no repair to the board, but no diamond. It's still nice that there's no ace out there. I'd like to get all the money in as soon as possible. I bet a thousand. The cutoff doesn't appear to want to let go of his cards just yet. He may have somehow connected with this flop in a big way because he rips it in our face for 2,600 more. There's no chance that we're getting away from our hand for this price. We call hoping that we're not completely crushed. The opponent asks if we want to run it once or twice. It's up to you. I have kings. You can do whatever you want. Without showing what he has, the opponent chooses for us to run it twice. It doesn't make a difference in the long run. It just reduces variance in the short run if you run it twice. This is a big game for me, so I'm happy to reduce the variance anyway. The opponent indicates that kings are ahead, at least at the moment. The first turn is the ace of hearts. I don't like seeing it. That card is followed by the seven of spades, so I lose the hands like ace queen or ace high flush draws that turn to pair. The second turn is the deuce of diamonds. I again lose to ace high flush draws. The final card is another nine. This is about a $9,000 pot. 
Assuming the opponent got it all in against us with anything reasonable, I'd be happy if we could somehow win half of this. The issue is that the opponent shows that he jammed on us with pocket deuces, which is not reasonable at all, and we somehow only win half of this. We had the opponent in terrible shape, but he drills one of two outs on the second run out to split the pot with us. Two cents, <laughs> wow. One time. <laughs> this one hurts badly to chop, it's rare to get it in that good, and to not win the entire pot feels like a loss. Sometimes it's tough to mentally come back from these situations. At least we're up about 1700 on the day when we pick out pocket nines in the cutoff. A few more pros have entered the game to replace some of the recreational players, so it's not quite as good as it was at first. I raised to 100. One of those new pros, three bets to 460, which isn't very nice of him. It's a large sizing. Still, we're both deep. If we can flop a set, maybe we can win a big one. I call for 360 more. We're heads up in position. The dealer puts out 1093 with two spades. We've got middle set on a coordinated board. I'm trying to contain my excitement as the opponent reaches for chips. He down bets at 360. I'm debating whether or not we should make our move now. We don't want to see any spade or really any overcard to the board because they'll either complete possible straight draws, potentially give my opponent a higher set, or possibly scare my opponent from wanting to put more money in the pot if he has queens for example and an ace or king comes out. It's best to try and get as much money in now as possible. I raise to a thousand. The opponent doesn't appear to be considering a fold. It looks like he's either going to call or raise. I wouldn't be able to get my chips in fast enough if he does raise. If he has a set of tens, it's just not our day. The big blind calls, he probably has some type of strong draw or an overpair. The turn is the eight of diamonds, queen jack, jack seven, and seven six make a straight. The big blind checks, despite our hand being downgraded, we can't allow the opponent to see a free card. I'm sticking with our plan to target overpairs and big flush draws. I increased the bet sizing to 3,000. I don't exactly want to get jammed on, but we'll certainly be calling a shove if the opponent rips it. Instead, he calls. If he had us beat, he would have gotten it all in by now. The fact that he didn't makes me very confident that we've got the best hand. The only holding that I could see the opponent playing the same way up to this point that beats us is exactly Queen Jack of Spades. Even then, I still think he probably would have shoved the turn. The river is the six of clubs putting four to the straight on board. This has become a huge pot. We have $7,010 behind. The big blind checks. It's not likely that the opponent has a seven in his hand. and We've already ruled out a set of tens in most Queen Jack combinations. Even with four to the straight on board, by process of elimination, I'm confident that we've got the winner. If we want to bet, our best option is to shove. The opponent could still possibly call us with any overpair if he thinks that we're bluffing with a missed draw like King Jack or missed flush draw. Earlier on in my poker career, I'd occasionally play scared and check back a hand like this one on this board. Not anymore. I jam for over $7,000. If we get called, this will be a $23,000 pot, which would be the biggest pot that I've ever played at Bellagio. We don't get snapped, so I'm feeling better and better about the situation. The big blind is perplexed. He isn't sure if I'm bluffing or not. The nuts have drastically changed since the flop came out, yet here I am, firing big on all three streets, saying that I'm not afraid to play for stacks. The big blind puts in a handful of yellow calling chips. We excitedly turn over our middle set. It's good. We get the absolute maximum to win the biggest pot that we've ever won at this property. There's no better feeling in poker than using all the information available to you to make the most money possible. After we get a count of the chips, the entire pot comes our way. The pro who we got is steaming and immediately picks up the scraps that he has remaining. We're up 13,000 on the session. If we left right now, it'd be my second biggest win ever, but we're not leaving. We pick up pocket tens about 20 minutes later. We're on the button. I raise to 100. The small blind wants a piece. He three bets to 440. Apparently, he didn't see the shellacking that I put on the previous opponent who tried the same move on us earlier. I call for 340 more. Usually in these types of situations, I like to drill sets. That's what we do here. The flop comes 10-4-3 rainbow. We've got top set on a relatively dry board. Unfortunately, this time our opponent checks. We've got to start trying to get some money in here. I make a small bet of 360 to keep the small blind in with a variety of non-pair hands. The opponent isn't impressed. He puts in the check raise to 1140. Wow. Does he somehow also have a monster? We both started this hand extremely deep. I'm still amped up on winning the previous hand. Usually I'd flat to let the small blind keep bluffing, but in this case, I'm concerned that even that will look suspicious. There's a good chance that the opponent will just shut down if a check raise of his gets called. I re-raised to 3,500. I'm hoping that the opponent either has a set or an overpair that he can continue with, or maybe he just won't believe that I'd put a third bet in on the flop with the nuts and will do something wild. After all, it's extremely unlikely that I'd make two sets and three bet pots just 20 minutes apart. The small blind doesn't have anything. He folds after only a few seconds. I got over anxious with that one and pulled the trigger too soon. I 
played one of the best hands that I played all year, followed by one of the worst ones with that re-raise. Part of my concern was that if the opponent had some kind of straight draw and he hit it, I'd double him up for 17,000. I didn't want to give him a chance to see the turn without paying extra for it, since he would have had massive implied odds. Also, any ace, deuce, five, six, or seven complete straight draws. The only turns that allow us to keep the nuts are nines and eights. In this case, since it appears that the opponent had very little, I let him off the hook easy and could have potentially made a lot more if he was willing to triple barrel bluff. Five and a half hours in, we pick up pocket nines in the straddle. The opponent who check raised us in the tens hand raises to 120. The hijack calls, the cutoff calls, I don't want to reopen the action, I call for 80 more. We're going four ways to the flop, it's 7 deuce deuce rainbow, it's about as good as it gets without us improving to a set. We all check, the turn is another deuce, we've got a full house. We need to bed to protect our equity, I make it 360 to go. The initial preflop raiser calls, I wonder if he somehow has a higher pocket pair, it's a bit too ambitious for the middle position player to call with two overs when there's still multiple players behind him. The hijack comes out of nowhere with a raise to 1400. This doesn't make much sense at all. Did he check on the flop with 7's full? It seems more likely that he's just trying to see where he's at with a single 7 or a worse pocket pair than ours. The cutoff folds. I call hoping that the player in between us folds. He doesn't. He puts in a back 3 bet to 3200. What on earth is going on in this hand? The middle position player will rarely have a deuce. He could have a hand like pocket aces or pocket 7's, but I'm not completely buying it. The hijack folds. I now consider turning my hand into a bluff because I'll have more suited deuces in my range than anyone else, and I'll also have pocket 7s. If I put in a back 4 bet bluff to try and get an even higher over pair or even pocket 7s to fold, it would be one of the most elaborate and sickest moves that I've ever made if it got through. I don't have the heart to try it because it could also decimate the stack if it doesn't work out. I fold, not knowing exactly what we're up against. I'm suspicious. What kind of bluff did we have there? No bluff? Later on, the opponent named Dylan lets us know for the vlog that he indeed made the back 3 bet with pocket aces. The hijack says that he raised the turn and then folded pocket 6s. This qualifies as losing a significant pot, it's time to rack up a massive win.